I want to talk to you this week about how to keep from being defeated by your problems. This week, the Lord reminded me that this pandemic from coronavirus is a perfect example of why we have to be ready for anything at any time. None of us know what a day might hold. So we have to know what to do to keep from being defeated when something horrible happens to us. Ordinarily, I like to tell you a funny story and make you laugh because life is hard enough as it is. But what I have to say today is so extremely important and so serious, I'm going to forego the funny story. Some of the best marriages I have ever seen in my life have ended up with one person saying, I don't love you anymore and I want a divorce. Some of the best families that I have ever known in my ministry have ended up with the parents and the children not speaking to each other. Some of the finest people I've ever known have gotten some of the most raw deals I've ever seen. A good friend of mine who made over $100,000 a year and was a great guy ended up being fired unfairly and wrongly. Even worse than some of those things, some of the finest people I've ever known have died of cancer and left their families. Some of the people that I have known who've had a baby or a child die. Other people have lost their job, couldn't pay their mortgage, and ended up losing their house with nowhere to go. So when I say to you that you need to be ready for anything at any time, I mean that exactly. You don't know what might happen to you or someone in your family, even if you're a Christian. Christians aren't exempt from horrible problems. So the question is, how do you keep from being defeated by your problems? especially when they're totally unexpected and out of the blue and just shock you, like divorce or the death of a child or a disease like cancer taking your spouse. How do you keep from being defeated? I want to teach you a concept that I don't think I've ever said here at the church, and I don't think I've ever said it on any of the videos. In order for you to be strong emotionally, you have to be strong spiritually. In order for you to have the strength to cope with whatever might come your way, you're going to have to be strong spiritually. 1 John 4, 4 says, Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. That means that God is greater than Satan. But I want to tell you, you on your own and your own strength and ability are no match for Satan. Unless you try to fight your battles in God's power, you'll be defeated for sure. Many people who claim to be Christians have had nervous breakdowns, heart attacks, strokes, just like people who aren't Christians. How could that be? Well, some of them were not strong spiritually, and therefore they were not strong emotionally. So the question is, what should you do the next time you face circumstances out of your control and it throws you for a loop completely and tries to defeat you emotionally and spiritually? Well, the answer to that is to follow a pattern that God has laid out in his word. It's called the cycle of victorious living. I want to read it to you. It's in the book of Psalms. It's in Psalm 37. This is what Psalm 37 says. Do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious toward wrongdoers. They will all wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and continue doing good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness to God. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. 
He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and do what's really easy for all of us. Wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out evil schemes. Cease from anger, forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only leads to evil doing, and evil doers will be cut off. But those who wait on the Lord will inherit the land. And yet a little while the wicked man will be gone. He will be no more. You will look for him carefully, and you will look for his place, but he will not be there. But the humble will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. There's a cycle that you can follow <clears throat> from the next time you are shocked by something that startles you and alarms you and scares you and throws you for a loop and you don't know what to do. It's called the cycle of victorious living. I want to walk through the steps of the cycle of victorious living so that you can know what they are. As you will see on the chart, the very first one is commit. It says in verse 5, commit your way to the Lord or commit your problem or your situation to the Lord. Obviously, before you do that, you're going to have to commit yourself to the Lord. You're going to have to turn your life completely over to the Lord. Not just accept the Lord and live a typical American blah Christian life, but truly commit your life to God. Truly surrender yourself completely to Him. Once you get your life committed to the Lord, once you get your life in God's hands, then as you're going along, in order for you to keep from being defeated by your problems, you're going to have to commit your problems, your circumstances out of your control, your fears, the things that throw you for a loop, the things that you're afraid will defeat you. You're going to have to commit them to the Lord. What does that mean? Turn the situation over to him. Take your hands off of it. Give it to him completely. Put it in his hands. Let him have it. Circumstances out of your control, like this pandemic from coronavirus, you can't change it. You can't even do anything about it. So commit it. Commit it to God. Turn it over to him. Put it in his hands and leave it there. It's one thing to get to the place where when you're thrown for a loop and you're in shock and you're scared to death that something terrible is going to happen as the result of what's happened, it's one thing to be able to commit it to God and turn it over to God and put it in his hands. It's a whole different thing to leave it there. When I was a younger Christian, I had a really bad habit of knowing this process, but not following it through. Something would happen that would shock me or alarm me or throw me for a loop or scare me to death, and I was afraid something awful would happen. And finally, after wrestling with it, I would commit it to the Lord and get it in his hands. But see, the second step of the cycle that you'll see on the chart is then trust him to take care of it. Trust him with it. It says in uh, verse 5 at the end of the verse, trust him and he will do it. It's one thing to commit it to God, turn it over to him, get it in his hands. It's a whole other thing to leave it in his hands. And when I was younger, I would commit it to God and turn it over to him and get it in his hands. And then after a little while, when nothing happened in the time that I thought it should happen, I would take it back from him and take it out of his hands and try to fix it myself and try to make it the way that I thought it ought to be and mess it up worse than it was in the first place. I'm sure that many of you have probably done that just like I have done that. So I want you to think about after you commit it to him, leave it in his hands. Trust him 
to do what's best. Romans 4.21 says, Abraham was fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. Think about that. After Abraham would commit something to the Lord, like the life of his son, he was fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. When you trust in the Lord and believe that he will do it, you're saying he'll take care of it. He'll bring to pass what his word says and what he's promised me in prayer. And even though it's getting worse instead of getting better, I got to keep my sticky fingers off of it and let God take care of it. You have to believe that God will do what's in your best interest. Do you believe that? When circumstances are out of your control and it seems like life is out of control, do you believe that God will do what is in your best interest? He will. His word says he will. Romans 8.28 in New American Standard Translation says, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and are living according to his purpose. You have to believe him to do that. It's sort of like you go to the doctor and he tells you you need surgery. And it's sort of like the day of surgery comes and you go to the hospital and you go to the uh, waiting room. Uh, the, they call it a pre-op room. And when you go to the pre-op room and you get on your gown and everything is getting ready and you're waiting for the anesthesiologist to come and you're waiting to be taken off on the cart and taken to surgery and you have told the surgeon, I trust you, I trust you to take care of this. I trust you to do what is best and what is right. And I believe it'll turn out right. And then just before they come to get you, to take you to surgery, you run out of the room and run out of the hospital in your hospital gown, and you're running to your car in your hospital gown, and get in the car and go home. You told the doctor you believed he could do it, and take care of it, and fix it, and make it right, but you didn't trust him to do it. It's the same thing with a mechanic with your car. It's one thing to tell him that you'll bring it to him and trust him with it and leave it there till he gets it fixed. And it's another thing to take it to him and leave it there and let him fix it. Are you just talking a good game and telling God a lot of nice things? Or are you really living out what you're telling the Lord and trusting him to take care of it. I want to talk to you about the third phase of the cycle. It's the phase that I've really struggled with the most. Um, it's after you commit the problem to God, as you are trusting him to take care of it, to delight yourself in the Lord. The word delight means to derive your joy in life from the Lord. When I first saw this cycle of victorious living, and I first saw the first two parts, commit it to God, trust Him to take care of it, that all made sense to me. When I got to the third step, delight yourself in the Lord, I'm thinking, what in the world is the matter with you people? Maybe someone's baby just died. Maybe they just ended up in a divorce. Maybe they just lost their job and are about to lose their house. What do you mean, delight yourself in the Lord? How in the world could you do that? Well, it doesn't mean be happy. It doesn't mean um, like what has happened. Joy is a totally different thing than happiness. Happiness is tied to circumstances. But joy is tied to the faithfulness of God. To delight yourself in the Lord 
in the midst of your problems means to derive your joy in life, not from your mate, not from one of your children, not from your job, not from the money you make from your job, not from the stuff you buy with the money, not with something that you enjoy doing. To delight yourself in the Lord means to derive your joy in life from your relationship with God. It says in the book of Hebrews that Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. God never changes. He is stable and steady and will be there for you no matter what you're going through. You might not be happy. You probably won't be happy. But you can have joy in your relationship with God. What do you mean by that, Pastor Ron? I mean, instead of finding your fulfillment in whatever it is that you enjoy the most in life, find your fulfillment in a satisfying, rewarding relationship with God. Have you gotten to the place where you love the Lord more than you love anything or anybody else in the world? Have you gotten to the place that you're obeying Colossians 1.18 in New American Standard, it says that he might come to have first place in everything. Is the Lord driving the car of your life? Or is he just going along for the ride and you're still in charge and really doing what you want to do, just calling yourself a Christian? When you come to the place that you surrender yourself completely to God and turn your life over to Him as well as your problems and you trust Him to take care of them and you start delighting yourself in the Lord, deriving your joy in life from your relationship with God, it will change your life. Pastor Ron, are you telling me that I can have joy even after I grieve over my mate dying and after giving God a period of time to help me to adjust and I can truly have joy and derive it from my relationship with God, absolutely, I have men and women in our congregation who are doing it. Pastor Ron, you're literally telling me that one of your children could die and you could want to die and after a reasonable period of time of letting God help you to grieve, it's different for different people, you could have more joy in the Lord and love God more than you did before. Absolutely. I know people who are doing it. And the same is true for anything else that you'll ever go to. But the trick is you've got to love God more than anything or anybody else in the world. He's got to be the most important person to you in life. You've got to be deriving your fulfillment in life from your relationship with him, not stuff or people or things or anything else, but from him. And if you're there deriving your joy in life from your relationship with God, before something horrible happens to you, you'll still struggle. You'll still grieve. You'll still really hurt. But God will help you get through it, and you'll come out the other side better for it, and you'll end up closer to him than you've ever been. It's been one of the greatest lessons of my life, because the Bible says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Not the joy of my marriage, the joy of my children, the joy of my job, the joy of my money, the joy of my stuff. No. The joy that I derive from my relationship with the Lord is where I draw my strength. And it'll be there for you even during the toughest times of your life. I want to close by um, talking to you about something that most of us don't do well. I got a couple of friends who do it really, really well, but they're sickening, so don't worry about them. Those of us that are normal, uh, we struggle with it. When you face the toughest times of your life, 
When you go through something you've never been through before, like a pandemic that puts limitations on you that you've never known before, you've got to commit it to God. You've got to turn it over to him and get it in his hands. You've got to trust him with it and leave it in his hands and not panic when things get worse instead of better. Leave it in his hands and believe him to do what's right. While that's going on, instead of being discouraged and depressed and down and blah, you've got to derive your joy in life from your relationship with the Lord. People will let you down. You can't find fulfillment in things. You've got to derive your joy in life from your relationship with the Lord, especially during the worst times in your life. But after that, when things don't change and nothing gets better, <clears throat> just like the coronavirus right now, nothing's any different than it was a month ago. We don't know when it's going to be better. You've got to rest and wait patiently for God, just like Pastor Ron does, perfectly. Just resting and waiting in the Lord and laying in a hammock and basking in the sun. No, 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 no. That's not what Pastor Ron does, and I'm just messing with you. It happens to be that um, waiting on the Lord is the absolute hardest thing I've ever done, ever, ever, ever in my life. I don't do it well. I don't do it well at all. So let's deal with the harder part. Rest in the Lord. I had to look it up. What does that mean? In New International Version and the New Living Translation, rest means be still. Yeah, buddy, that's who I am. Be still, especially when everything's going crazy. It means stop worrying. Stop fretting. Stop stewing about the situation. Rest in the fact that God will do the right thing if you'll leave it in his hands and stop trying to fix it yourself. I just confess to you, I've never done this well. I'm a little better now that I'm 84 years old, but I've never done this well at all. Every time something shocks me and throws me for a loop, I do my best to rest in the Lord, but I have to work on it constantly. After you try to rest, calm down, be still, don't stew and fret, leave it in his hands, then you have to do the hardest thing of all, wait. I just don't wait well. I don't. I just don't. Waiting for me means doing nothing. And I'm a fix-it guy. We have a problem? Good. We have a big God? Let's go fix it. Give it to me, and I'll take care of it. No, not with circumstances out of your control. I can't even fix it with my car. If you have something on your car that works, I can break it, but I can't fix it if it doesn't work. So I should know by that to let the Lord take care of it. Waiting is one of the toughest things that any of us will ever do. I want you to listen to this definition of being patient. Because that's what it says in the verse that says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Patient means to endure pain or problems without complaining. Yeah, that's me. Without losing self-control. Calmly tolerating the problem. That's who I am. I know that you're probably a lot like me. I know that you don't rate, wait real well. I can tell you that if you live in the cycle, if you commit it to God, if you trust him with it and leave it in his hands, if you derive your joy in life from your relationship with God 
and delight in him. And if you will just do whatever it takes to rest, be still, stop stewing and fretting, and wait patiently, if you'll live the cycle out, it'll come out right. How do you know that, Pastor Ron, for sure? I know that because I've experienced it personally. In December of 2015, two days before Christmas, December 23rd, I was in the office of a uh, surgeon, and he came in his door with a piece of paper and said, Ron, this is serious, and it's got to be dealt with, and it has to be dealt with soon. You do have prostate cancer. It does have to be taken care of, and you have a six-week window to do it. Two days before Christmas is when I found out. Wanda was gone. Wanda was uh, taking care of her mother, whose health had failed, and she and I agreed that she could go and literally live with her mother, and she was doing the right thing. And uh, I was alone when that news came to me, not because she didn't care, but we had agreed and did not know. And so I was by myself when I had to absorb this news, and I was by myself when I came home, and I was by myself when I called Wanda, and I was by myself after I got off the phone and had to process this information. Of course, the first thing it does is scare you. The doctor said, you have a six-week window to take care of this. I said, how far out can I go? How long can I wait to have this? Um, the first part of the year is when we need to get all our year-end stuff done for the church. I have a lot of work I need to do. And he said, the furthest out you can go is the second week of February in 2016. I said, good, I'll take as far out as I can go so I can get as much work done. Wanda immediately changed her plans, brought her mother home to live with us, and Wanda took care of her there while she was uh, getting ready to take care of me. And so as we go into this surgery, I am committing this to the Lord. I'm literally committing this to God and trusting him with it. I would have to be honest with you, and I'd have to tell you, it's one of the only major problems I've ever faced in life that didn't throw me for a loop emotionally. And um, I just couldn't believe it. Even when I was alone by myself before Wanda got back, and even before friends started coming to talk to me and help me, I couldn't believe it. God really, really helped me. Once I got the thing into the Lord's hands and started trusting him with it and realized there isn't a thing you can do. There isn't anything you can do about it. The um, surgeon you're having do this surgery has a 90% success rate, but he told me there are those 10%, some of whom who died. And so once I got it into God's hands and was able to leave it there, <clears throat> it was an amazing thing to me that I was able to derive my joy in life from the Lord. I wasn't able to derive my joy in life from my health. I wasn't able to enjoy to derive my joy in life from activities that I wanted to do that if I didn't have this surgery, I'd never be able to do. I had to derive my joy in life from my relationship with God. And for one of the first times in my life, God helped me. He helped me to do that. It was the resting and waiting on God that really convinced me of this process. What happened was um, the time that I spent alone before one ever came home and those nights by myself and those long hours of prayer ended up God giving me the deepest peace I ever had in my life, ever. God had given me a very deep peace when I accepted him as my Savior and when I surrendered my life completely to him as Lord and when I agreed to spend my life in the ministry and God had given me a very deep peace when I uh, changed places where I was living and went to a different church and God had given me a deep peace about traveling and speaking in churches but never like the peace that he gave me when I was facing cancer surgery and could die. 
And it was that peace that helped me to rest and wait for God. I wouldn't tell you that I waited much more successfully than I've ever waited for anything. I don't wait real well for anything, but I did better that time because of the deep peace that God gave me. I can remember vividly uh, being in the pre-op room. Uh, I can remember vividly there were all kinds of people in my pre-op room. There's only supposed to be two people in there. There's like 10 or 15 people in there, and I can remember them telling me jokes and us having fun and laughing with the nurses and and I can remember just before they wheeled me away, a deep, deep, deep peace. I can remember waking up on the gurney as the nurse was wheeling me into the recovery room at 1.30 in the afternoon. You're done, Mr. Richmond, you're done. The doctor's going to come and see you soon. Everything went really, really well. He got it all you're going to be fine. And I can remember laying there by myself with the deepest peace I've ever had and the greatest joy I've ever known. I can remember the Lord whispering in my ear, you're going to be better than ever. And God has proven that to be true, not just physically or not just emotionally, but spiritually and in my ministry, I've been better and God has blessed me more than I've ever known before. So whether it's this pandemic, whether it's cancer, whether it's someone in your family dying, whether it's losing your job or whatever it is that scares you that might happen sometime, I want to encourage you that if you'll allow God to help you and you'll commit it to him and trust him to take care of it and derive your joy in life from your relationship with God during a tough time and rest the best you can and wait for him, God will take care of it. It will turn out right and you won't have had anything to worry about. Let's pray, okay? Father, I know that it's real, and I know that it works. If we will take the hardest things we ever go through and commit them to you and not take them back into our hands and try to fix them and mess them up more, but trust you to take care of it. And Lord, if somehow you can help us to delight ourselves in you, not in the problem or anything else, but to delight ourselves in our relationship with you and draw our strength from you and rest by the peace that you give us and wait for you to work. It will turn out right. Help us to do that now during this pandemic with no answers and no way to know what's going to happen and how we're going to ever get to the other side of this, God. We're going to get to the other side by trusting in you and leaving it in your hands and letting you take care of it and not messing our lives up ourselves. So help us to live out the cycle of victorious living, not just in this pandemic, but when we face the biggest problems of our lives. In your son's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. I hope you have a wonderful day. Um, I'm looking forward to being with you next week. Next week, we're going to start a series. Uh, instead of standalone sermons each week, we're going to start a series on God's will for your life and how to have God's best in your life and how to have the best life you can have, the life God created you to live. I'm really looking forward to it. See you next week. Hi, everybody. This is Pastor Ron from the Church of the Nazarene in Highland, Indiana. We are uh, just so glad to have you with us. Why are you waving at me?